I would very much like to read the first scripture, the first scripture of the second chapter of the Song of Solomon. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. Now, I would like to illustrate that lesson as we go along because it has to do with a considerable amount of prophecy. First, let us take a look at this. Jesus says, I am the rose of Sharon. I am the rose. Now, of course, we have here also the lily, but we'll come to the lily a little bit later on. Now, when Jesus came into the world, he came as a rose. I want you to take particular notice thereof that the rose has many thorns. Now, Jesus is not the type of a Savior to have a lot of thorns in his life. But when he came into, when he came into this well, he came across and found that there are many, many thorns in this world, and because of the thorns, it merely and simply suggests that if we are like Him, and since we are going to live a life like unto the Christ, we, like Him, will be buffeted many times, will be pushed here and pushed there, and we will suffer as we encounter many disappointments, possibly sorrows, one thing or another, and all of these things as they arise are constituted as thorns in our Christian life. Now the thorn is not typified as a sinner. A non-Christian has nothing to do with the flower. He as yet does not know Jesus, therefore he cannot be as a rose. In order for a man to become a rose, he must accept the Christian life. He must accept Christ as his personal Savior, and as soon as he does, Jesus says, as I am, so shall ye be. Then again he says, if any man will deny himself, let him take up his cross and follow me. Now if you also take notice, the cross typifies many of the thorns that is on the stem of the rose. Because by no means is the Christian life in this world a life of ease and a life of pleasure and a life that is constantly a life of good time from morn till evening. Jesus says, this world is not my home. This world is not your home. Therefore, the world has no place for you, and you have no part for the world. But we are here in this world until Jesus comes, and when He will take us out of this world, and when He does, then eventually all the thorns shall vanish away, but we will still be as the rose of Sharon. Because Jesus says, the Scripture says, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we do know that when Jesus shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now, let us learn something about this rose. Jesus came to save souls, to save sinners, but He Himself did not save anyone as 
an individual. He came to prepare the way so that you and I can follow the Christ in the salvation of souls. He prepared the way. He opened up the door. He paid the price, but He never saved any individual. He gave that responsibility over to you and I. As a members of the family of God, we positively have an obligation. We have a responsibility. And that is, as the Rose of Sharon, in spite of the fact that that we may be buffeted many times because of the thorns. We must still go out into the highways and the byways and compel the people to come in that my house may be filled, said Jesus. That is our responsibility. And I must say to us that you and I, if we ever expect a deeper life, if we ever expect something that will cause us to recognize the absolute reality of our Christ and know that Jesus is indeed our Christ and our God, that He gave us this responsibility, then you and I must take Him at full face. We must take Him for granted and say, yes, Lord, in spite of the thorns that it may appear upon my body, I am still a rose, and the rose belongs to Almighty God. And I must also say that you and I cannot possibly realize and understand what it means when He says, and you shall be in me, and I shall be in you, unless we are by experience and by actual facts of realization, by working for the Master, will we know and understand the deeper life that is in God. I do not believe that because I am a Christian now, all I need to do is just sit and twiddle my thumbs and say, Jesus, Jesus will one day come. When He comes, I am ready. Let me not be so sure of that. Because five of the ten virgins were foolish enough to believe it. And when Jesus came, they almost knocked down the door trying to get in, but did not succeed. And so Jesus, in spite of the fact that there are all kinds of resentment in this life. Uh, Jesus went through it first. Uh, he went through all of that. And now He expects you and I when He says, follow me, because the world out there is full of sinners, full of people who do not know God. And the responsibility is up to you. Porterfield Baptist Church is the house of God. It should be filled. And that is our obligation. Let us therefore do what we can to fill the house of God. No matter what the circumstances, no matter the consequences, no matter the price which we have to pay, let us look forward in doing our little bit in the name of the Lord for in our Christ. Amen. Now, you say, but the world despises me. The world hates me. The world is against me. I cannot do anything. Let us recognize this. Jesus says, I am the rose of Sharon. You and I also are as an individual the rose of Sharon. But when we have accepted that Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and we walk with God and we talk with God and Christ is dominant in our individual life, 
then He says, I am in you, and you in me. And we are twisted around together so that we become one in the Christ Jesus. And not until we positively have that full life, not until we are completely and personally acquainted with the Son of God, do we really understand and realize the meaning of the deeper life. Hallelujah. So that I can walk down the avenue in the fullness of the joy and peace of the Spirit of God. No matter what the clouds may bring. And no matter how about the thief, the robber that is lurking in the way. I shall not be afraid because my hope is in the Christ. Christ, He and I are one. But in order for He and I to be one, I must completely, completely yield my life to Him. I must completely yield my life to Him. What saith the Scripture in the 8th chapter of Romans and the 14th verse? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And if I live, I say I'm a Christian and live an independent life apart from the Spirit of God then I do not believe that I have the witness, the testimony of God. I do not believe that I am a part of the yielded vessel unto God. I cannot accept that full life because the Spirit of God will not reveal the deeper things of God unto me. Because I am not a conscientiously follower of the fullness of God as He says, come now and follow me. I cannot thus be that way. Now, let me say this before we go any further with the lily. Now, we have here, regardless of who we are, what we are, no matter where, no matter what, if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we have been washed in the precious blood of the Christ. We are members of the family of God without discrimination, without race or color, without breed. We are all members of the family of God and we are one because uh, the church of Jesus Christ is one even though the body has many members yet the church is one and in the 16th chapter of Matthews uh, and the 16th verse uh, Jesus says upon this rock me I will build my church uh, and the gates of hell shall not prevail upon against it. So regardless of who we are, where we are, if we are a child of God, we are a member of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are all together in one body. Amen. It might not appear in some places, but we are all members of the one body of the Lord Jesus Jesus Christ, and I want us to understand that the body of the Christ is sinless. It is absolutely sinless. It is without a spot and without a wrinkle, without a blemish, without anything. That is the kind of a life God expects us to live if we proclaim ourselves a member of the body of the Christ. It is true that in this life, in this world, we cannot be perfect. I don't claim to be perfect, and you better not either. But we must strive to reach perfection. We must strive. We, by the grace of God, by the help of the Holy Spirit, 
it in our individual life uh, as we are yielded to the Holy Ghost uh, as He becomes dominant in our lives uh, and as we are led by the Spirit of God. He will lead us to higher heights uh, and deeper depths uh, and the closer we get to the Christ, uh, the further away we become from uh, the world. Remember that when Abraham climbed the mountain closer to God, further away from the world. When uh, when uh, Moses talked to God, it was on the mountain top, away from the world. When Jesus wanted to talk to His Father, He went to the mountain Gethsemane. And as they came, they were further and further away from the world. That is a lesson for all of us. The closer we get to God, the further we must get away from the world. We are in the world, but we are no longer a part of the world. Therefore, forsake the world and everything that is in it, because now we are a member of the body of the Christ. And like the Christ Himself, we must strive and do all we can to be pure, to be spotless, without a blemish of any kind, uh, so that people will say, He doesn't have to tell me He's a Christian. I could tell it. (laughs) Amen. I could tell it. I could tell. First of all, because of the brightness of the Christ shining in His eyes, because of the love light that is upon His face, because of the good things that He talks about, because He does not go in the way of the sinner, neither does He sit in the seat of the scornful. He is different. He is entirely different. He must be a Christian. Therefore, He is a child of God, a member of the family of God. Let us start again before we touch on this ribbon here. Let us start all over again, shall we? Alright, there's coming a day. There is coming a day in the second chapter of the Song of Solomon and the eighth verse. Arise, my love, and come away, for the winter is past and gone. Summer is here, and the birds are singing in the land. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in the land. Arise, my beloved, my fair one, and come away. That is an indication of the rapture. Amen. Alright, as soon as the rapture takes place and the rose of Sharon goes with God, I want you to notice first of all that all the thorns in the rose are gone. They are there no more. Now the first verse of that second chapter, you find the word A M D right there in the middle. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. You cannot be a rose and a lily at the same time. In this life, Jesus was a rose. But then there is coming a day following the rapture when the millennial reign is in full force in this world. Jesus said, I am the lily of the valley. Hallelujah. And all of the people that made the glory and all of the people that made the rapture, all of the people People that were members of the family of God. And when Jesus says, Come up hither, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. And we, as blood washed Christians, arise, translated, transformed, and a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And there we are with Jesus. We leave all the thorns behind in this world, they don't belong 
on the other side. And as Jesus, we are now completely sanctified, holy sanctified. We are as pure as pure can be. And just like Jesus, I am now a lily of the valley. Do you know that there's coming a day during the tribulation period that this earth is going to reel back and forth like a drunken man. This whole earth is going to reel like a drunken man. And all the high mountains and the high places shall become low until this world is nothing but valleys. Amen. Level places and valleys. And Jesus says, I am the lily of the valleys. Or in other words, He is upon the throne of the whole world. Upon the rebuilt tabernacle of His father David. That has been broken down. Amen. He is now upon the throne of the glory of Almighty God. For the kingdom of heaven has come down to earth. And as Jesus sits upon the throne in the city of Jerusalem, then the church who is His wife will sit on His right side. Hallelujah. Judging the twelve tribes of Israel worldwide and executing authority over all the earth because we have paid the price here. And over on the other side, as the Christ said, I have overcome and am sat down with my Father on His throne. And because you have overcome, you shall also sit down with me on my throne. Therefore we are one. We are tied together. And by the way, may I remind you, may I remind you that what a man and a woman, they get married, they are bound to each other. Two, saith he, are one flesh. Two, saith he, are become one flesh. When the sun shines, when the sun doesn't shine, over good paved road, over rough road, or regardless of whatever the terrain may be, for better or for worse, two, saith he, are one. Then let them walk down the highway together. Together, together, amen. Isn't that lovely? Together, hallelujah. Therefore, now it is one body. Do you know the the color of the Christ is purple? Amen. We have here a purple bow, a purple ribbon. What does that mean? That means that you in this life, you don't have any part. This world is not for you. You don't have no right to execute authority in this world. In the first place, they don't want you because you're a Christian. But there will be a day when Jesus becomes the lily of the valley worldwide. You and I, the wife, the exposed wife of the Christ, will sit upon the throne with the Christ and we will rule and we shall execute authority worldwide. That is because of the benefit and the blessing that you and I have received because we have forsaken the world. We have forsaken everything that this world has to offer and have been tried and made white in the precious blood of the Son of God. And because we have paid the price and because we have followed Him even to the cross 
of Calvary. And God knows a lot of people have gone to the cross of Calvary as they follow their Lord and Master. But don't have any fear. Don't have any worry. The day is coming that you as a purified, sanctified son, child of the living God, you will one day sit upon the throne of the glory of the Christ uh, decorated in finery decorated with the rewards you have received because you labored for the Christ uh, and you will also be crowned uh, because you are the member or the exposed the wife uh, of the Christ of Calvary Amen how wonderful it is out there the blessings that belong to us what a wonderful thing there is in store for us if we will but hearken to thus saith the Lord and follow Him no matter where He leads I will follow now in closing let me say this uh, that he, that all of this experience, even before we do become a ruling monarch upon the throne of the Christ, executing authority worldwide, because authority we shall receive. Oh, I want you to consider the deeper life that is in the Christ and only in the Christ and only as we walk with Him and only as we yield ourselves to Him only as we obey thus saith the Lord in our life can we have that deeper experience that deeper life with the Christ it is real there is nothing foolishness about uh, the Christ uh, and that which He has to offer. But it's up to the individual. If you want that deeper experience with the Christ, it is yours simply for the asking. Hey man, how do I get it? Find yourself the lonesome place with God and you and Him talk about it. Amen. You and Him talk things over. Let Him talk to you. And you return conversation with Him. Let Him call you my son, my daughter, my child. And you call Him, Yes, Daddy, I will obey Thy every desire. God bless you is my prayer. Let us now enter into the study of the holy city. They turn for now is the only way through which the Great Commission can be fulfilled. War and witnessing don't mix. Extermination and evangelism are not compatible. But John says we will always be faced with turmoil <clears throat> and conflict. Someday there will be no more strained relations. No need for man to exist in an artificial environment of peace. John saw the real thing. He showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. I have spent most of my life in cities. I weary of the deterioration. The multiplication is greater than the renovation. They become infested. The thought of a holy city is an ideal that mankind cannot grasp. It is just too much. We struggle with pollution, <clears throat> corruption, erosionism, salvanism. Every major city on earth is in trouble. A holy city would be the greatest of all miracles. First, an unholy city must be eliminated. The beast, the false prophet, the devil, no city 
could be holy with these around. They would be bribed, seduced, ruined, misled, and killed. These three, before arrest and sentence, leave a planet as devastated as Hitler and the Nazis left Germany. Their final effort to enlist the human race in total rebellion against the Creator <coughs> is finished. The very heavens which look down upon it have been purged. Satan, the instigator, is chained. Suddenly, amid debris, rubble, and slaughter, and wreckage worse than the flood, John sees something spectacular. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Prepare as a bride. Adorn for her husband. <clears throat> God has better things for us. The horror is now past. It is not a renovated Berlin. It is not an urbane renewed New York City. It is not a facelifted city of Paris, the city of sin. It is not a reconstructed Hong Kong, God's gift to a new race impoverished by rebellion, moral calamity, worship of Satan and the flesh will not be computerized factories multi-million dollar universities of fashions and commerce centers. It will be a gift of peace. It will signal the realization of man's most inward longing. It will be God's peace, not the shadow effort by a world court or the United Nations. It is Jerusalem, the city of the great king. God's description is a list of negatives. There is no death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain, no hunger, no thirst, no night, no sun, no moon, and no sin. The best we have ever been able to do is no passing, no parking, no walking on the grass, no turn, no loitering, no stopping. It is a total absence of what makes life uncomfortable, sad, and frustrating. There are no planes for hospitals, no plans of any kind, cemeteries, institutions for mental health, counseling centers, soup kitchen, bars, distilleries, prison, or even churches. It will be the great collapse of man and his God. Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the land's wife. The city is better than the garden. God has been working on it for a long time. He worked on the Bible for 1,600 years. It is an honor of the great Adam. Jesus, other cities have honored great men. Washington, Lindgren, Houston. This will be his city. It is the city of Romans. There is one fact that will not bend. It will never yield to argument. It cannot be ignored nor rescinded. It is a fact that Jesus loves us. It began in the councils of eternity. How he longed to fill Jerusalem with love instead of hate. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. This city shall be the epitome of the most exquisite love story of the universe. Adorn! It is the ultimate workmanship of the Father. It is Christ's own wedding gift. Christ has purchased the people. We have nothing to offer that is of value to Him. I am His by grace alone. But what He creates within me is precious. She is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrath gold. This city is for that people. Excluded are the cowardly. And it is a 
forever a cowardly thing to deny Jesus before men. The untrustworthy, the disgusting, the city is restricted and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever work it abomination or make it alive. The new Jerusalem will not yield to the subvervice uh, that destroys our urbane centers today. You need more than parks, public buildings, statues, boulevards, trees, and compass. We need, you need, a new creation. They which are written in the Lamb's book of life. This city will make any city on earth look ridiculously small in comparison. Some city dwellers have been called Londoners. Others have been known as Parisians. These residents will be called overcomers. It is the city of victors. Everyone is a winner. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son it will make the coward you hang around with today look crummy he will be the consummate payoff the eternal worthwhile gold it will make every struggle against sin a prize there will be no second class nor third class citizens this will be the administrative capital. God's laws will be executed promptly and properly. The mail will arrive on time. There will never be a hint of inflation, for the former things are passed away. Communications will have no gray areas. There will never be a congregational debate about violence. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. The educational system will be purified. There will be no more curse. It will minister efficiently beyond any dream of any system. Data enters today. The Lamb, Jesus, will be in it and a servant shall serve him. Jesus already has had a short residency on this planet. No one has yet reported a failure where he was concerned. Mister, I would rather work for Jesus and be directed by him than for any other name. The city will never be shaken or destroyed. It has foundations. You can count on the permanency. Your values will never be subject to the varieties of time, market, political climate, or change of government. The city rests upon the twelve who in Christ's name changed the history. What they preached and demonstrated can never be obliterated. The gospel today incorporated into the stream of mankind is the most permanent factor in all human record. We get the meaning of the walls from Isaiah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Uh, Calvary is a perfect refuge, and there shall be no why uh, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, <laughs> neither whatsoever work it abomination or make it a lie. There'll be no place for the club and bar, for the gambling casino. For profanity or lewdness, for the greedy or dishonorable, the city was pure gold, like unto crystal glass. No shady business of any kind can ever find a foothold. It is, this, it is a city of twelve. Twelve gates, twelve angels, twelve tribes, twelve foundations, twelve apostles, twelve pearls, and the measure twelve thousand furlongs. Why this emphasis? Twelve is the number of service. It is the perfect number before God. It is a number that means all is finished and complete. 
The city is not meant to be a resort area for one long eternity of violence. This city, 1,500 miles in every direction, including the height of it, without traffic hazards and totally air-conditioned with fixed climate controls. It meant to regulate and implement the planet and its in uh, enveloping space from man's scientific breakthrough have moved its century from the original anchor stations. It will be the update to the command. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Integration will be dissolved. The entrances point to all directions. There will be Eskimos, Siberians, Finns, and Mongolians. There will be Pakistanis, Palamanians, and Brazilians. There will be Turks, uh, Egyptians, and Czechs. Uh, There will be British, uh, Germans, and Americans on the other three sides, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. There is no super race, sir. The race that shines will be the redeemed. I would like to emphasize at this particular time that there will be no race, no nationality. There will be no one individual particular uh, people of any kind. But we will all be one. We shall all be a part of and member of the great family of God. The redeem of all ages shall gather and become one people in the Christ. It says in the Bible that, beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. It is the truth. There is no discrimination. There is no distinction. There is no race, no nationality. But we will all take on the attitude and the attire of the Christ and we shall reach the absolute perfection of total sanctification that the Christ is and was and will be upon us for we shall be like Him. The family of God when the total plan of God is completed and we enter into the new earth, a new people, a new race, the great family of God. The gates of pearl. Pearl always stands for suffering. There is only one entrance through his suffering. I must trust in that name. No righteousness that I have done will ever be accepted. The most amazing feature is the absence of my church or any other kind of a church. There will never be a church advertisement in the Saturday newspaper. And I saw, and I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. This can be quite a shock to some who are finding it extremely profitable to push some brand of religion. It doesn't matter there. It has no standing whatever. God's perfect glory does not need any denominational reflector. God's presence will satisfy and provide as it did in the wilderness. Of course, everyone will belong to the royal priesthood. We will exhibit to the powers of heaven the excellency of our fulfillment in Jesus to the intent that now unto the principality and powers in the heavenly places might be known as the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which He proposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
I will be complete in Him. It will be so good, sir, that I will need a new body, a better body. And I shall have it. It will be disease, the proof, weirdness, proof, imperious to carbonate or cancer. The supply of energy is from the man of Calvary. Here, we only have an earnest of our inheritance. We have a touch from time to time. There, we will know the fullness. I know this now. He is adequate for every need. The Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever, and none shall ever make us afraid. For the time of the end is fast approaching upon us, and what? We must do, we better do, we had to do, uh, because uh, the dark clouds of the tribulation are fast appearing. It doth not yet, my brethren, uh, uh, look upon us, because we sh uh, shall positively be delivered from the awfulness of the wrath that is to come. But only if we are in Christ shall we be delivered. Only if we have made our peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord, the man of Calvary who gave himself for us, that we through him might have the fullness of life, the life eternal in the new city, that new Jerusalem. The city that Abraham, our father, has long sought for, but in his earthly life of 175 years, has never been able to find, nor could he locate it. But in the fullness of his heart, and in the fullness of his faith and confidence, he knew that God was telling him the truth, that he knew that someday, somewhere, he would find that city and become an honorable citizen of it. And you too, my brethren, all of you who believe the Scripture, all of you who believe that God is real, is able to locate Himself in that city at the time when Jesus comes. For the time is coming that there will be a new earth, a new heaven, a new people, a family of God. Do you want to be a member of the family of God only through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is this possible. Now then, hear my voice, ye out there, out yonder. Today is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. If ye will hear His voice, harden not your heart, but accept the Christ of Calvary as your personal Savior and give Him the opportunity to live in you so that at the appointed come you shall hear His voice say, Enter now into the city of the great King, ye that are overcome. Are you listening? Will you heed? It's up to you. One time you love me, but
Thank you.